Hi all, our notable game today is an absolutely amazing encounter between Anatoly Karpov and Garry Kasparov in the 1985 World Championship match. So this actually started in 1985 after the aborted match, this was the uh, second match they had. Now, as a recap, in the first match, 1984-85, it was um, aborted after 48 games. The FIDE president, Florencio Campomanes, cancelled the event while it was still in progress. He said the match had exhausted the physical, if not the psychological resources, of not only the participants, but all, all those connected with the match. No winner was declared, so Anatoly Karpov retained the title. title. Uh, so this new World Championship match began on September, September the 3rd, 1985, with the score set at 0 0. A 24-game limit was set with a title holder and drawing the draw odds. If Karpov lost, he also had the automatic right to a rematch. The prize was 1.6 million Swiss francs with 62.5% going to the champion. For each draw, FIDE would deduct 1% of the purse and fine each player a further 1%. So actually the intensity of the match was, was much more decisive. The number of um, decisive games as a percentage was much greater than the first match. Surprise, surprise. Uh, now I take you to the cliffhanger game. Game 24, Anatoly Karpov needed to win this game in order to draw the match, in order to retain the world title. So you can't get really more dramatic than this. And to add to the drama, Anatoly Karpov kicked off with E4. He's usually playing D4. So he's challenging Kasparov on his home grounds on his favourite Sicilian Nidorf. In many ways, I think Fischer was influenced by Bobby Fischer to play the Sicilian night off, and also the King's Engine Defence. The influence of Fischer seems evident from the opening repertoire choices. And Sproff played the Sicilian defence here. So we have an exciting scene set for this game. Much more exciting than, say, a lot of, in, in my view, than a lot of the Queen's Gambit declines, which ended in draws in, in the first match. So Knight F3, we have a bloodthirsty Sicilian defense Neudorf variation emerging so knight f6 knight c3 now here we have the classic sicilian Neudorf and now Karpov chooses here bishop e2 now this may might seem quiet to you this this bishop e2 move but it can be followed up extremely aggressively let's see e6 the shavening and pawn formation here castles bishop e7 f4 these are all book moves standard book moves so f4 then the bishop is free to later to go to f3 it's kind of logical castles now here either bishop e3 or king h1 is usually played karpov chose king h1 getting the king off this potentially dangerous sensitive diagonal we have queen c7 and our standard plan would be b5 to try and put pressure on e4 with bishop b7 and b4 later. Karpov plays a4. Standard move, knight c6. We have bishop e3. Standard stuff so far. And this next move, again, pretty standard. Rook e8. Now we have bishop f3. Rook b8. And there's still hundreds of games from this position. Uh, the move in this game was queen d2. That was the move played. There's also g4. Both of these moves have over 200 games in my book. Queen d2. We have bishop d7. Now played. Bishop d7. Knight goes to b3. So white seems to be positionally uh, threatening, potentially a5 here to clamp down on the b6 square that positional threat is handled with black playing b6 so now if a5 he can play b5 or consider taking now here is where it gets aggressive it doesn't it's not a positional system as such the way it's played now and this is the main move the way it's played which is g4 yes g4 very very aggressive stuff you might think yes it looks pretty aggressive Bishop goes back to c8 here. 
Now that g4 has been played, there's a slight weakness on this diagonal. If the bishop can redeploy here, hopefully black can try and trade off at some point or weaken the diagonal by trading off the light square bishops to get to white's king. That is a potentially useful road to the king. g5, kicking the knight. Knight goes to d7. Now in light book here, bishop g2 is very, very popular in this position just to put the bishop in the classic fianchetto position there's 58 games of bishop g2 for example bishop g2 knight a5 queen f2 knight c4 bishop dropping back bishop b7 this is this is thought to be a slight advantage for white this position where both the bishops end up being fianchettoed the pressure on the scene file is kind of neutralized for a moment and white stands kind of nicely here but uh, yeah, in this game, we get queen f2, which has very aggressive intentions of maybe transferring the queen later to h4, but it's also putting pressure on the diagonal. And this also might be useful if the knight wasn't there later if black fianchetto bishop d4 might be supported. So at the moment, it's dual purpose bishop uh, queen f2. We have bishop f8. Bishop does fianchetto here. Back goes back. Bishop b7. So black is ready on the diagonal. Rook a d1 looking at d6. Yes, black is restricted as well. That d5 break is under control. The d5 square is clamped down here. We have now g6. Black is also with g6 trying to discourage f5. If f5, black would at least get the e5 square, maybe an opportunity to even try and exchange off light square bishops. White plays here, bishop c1. If we look at f5 actually for a moment, let's add a bit for a moment f5 here in fact better than taking this is dangerous because of knight d5 actually gaining a tempo on the queen so black has to be very very careful f5 it seems if f5 yeah you don't want to give up the d5 square knight c e5 might be the way it looks scary this f5 it does and white might might be actually technically better maybe this is a, a good way of playing it as an alternative to the game in fact so yeah this this retreat um bishop c1 it is not a top engine choice and, and might actually betray something about the nature of the position it demands attack i think this has been commented on by several commentators over the years that karpov is in an opening he really needs to go for the king it's the priority and this is like trying to be a bit positional maybe overly positional instead of going for the king with f5 this might have been a very very interesting opportunity actually to play it because you're going to see now Kasparov is, is is concerned about f5 and trying to discourage it he plays actually rook b c8 here and yeah there's latent pressure on the c file uh, but now Karpov's idea um, which is, is seemingly without f5 he wants to still attack the king but uh, he does so with rook d3 so clearly it's not just about the d6 pawn it's about rook h3 and queen h4 the thing is black would always have potentially the resource h5 to try and block things up you know even if it temporarily costs a pawn so this isn't extremely uh, dangerous or as dangerous as it might seem and Sparov takes the opportunity to play knight b4 actually encouraging the rook saying go there then go there go to the rook into h3 and now we see bishop g7 another perk of knight before it's not just pressure on c2 that d5 square is less sensitive for a key tempo gain so you see that f5 it might be more possible for black to like take on e5 without worrying to take on f5 without worrying about the d5 square there's two pieces on d5 as well here so interesting position black has achieved the double fianchetto 
if we just check out f5 at this point you'll see it's under less i believe you'll see it's under less favorable circumstances black can actually take but still even so even so here f5 is also interesting it seems at least from an engine point of view uh, if if white is carefully playing king takes g2 here to leave the queen there if queen takes then it might actually be possible to take here uh, this position is is very good for black but if on king takes apparently this this is still okay uh for white this position it looks scary but this is dangerous more dangerous for black this position so f5 it seems as though f5 was a key move here as well it's very interesting this game to look at the f5 opportunities that existed instead uh Karpov played bishop e3 now this has a lot of logic to it the knight's no longer on d4 so bishop d4 to get rid of this bishop would weaken these dark squares it's a very very logical attacking move from a certain perspective as well now against this f5 very very interesting prophylaxis now that starts from kasparov this next move is is what nimzovic would call a mysterious uh rook move he plays actually rook e7 believe it or not and it's a staggering idea it's not just a mysterious rook move because <laughs> can you see what black now plays Karpov actually he doesn't go in for queen h4 because i believe there's the h5 uh resource in this position he actually plays king g1 which looks fairly timid but in a way it's getting off this diagonal but if we look at queen h4 here let's just check queen h4 it's a very sharp position it might actually be possible h5 is not actually needed in fact knight f8 safety defends h7 but sometimes h5 will be a resource here it's just not needed and, and actually bad this position f5 or knight d4 this is very strong for white with f5 coming so knight f8 would be the move to defend on queen h4 so we see this move king g1 here very very sharp position can you guess what Sparov plays which is designed against f5 incredible move an incredible positional move is played here if I give you five seconds you might want to pause the video so what would you play in this position so five seconds to pause the video starting from now okay rook ce8 that's a double mysterious <laughs> two mysterious rook moves but they're designed against f5 this is prophylaxis in fact this is probably one of the most critical prophylaxis moves played in the history of the world championships in such a cliffhanger game where Karpov needed to win Kasparov is playing two rooks behind pawn it's designed against f5 here and there are some very very beautiful variations now if f5 is played in this position rook d1 was actually played but let's have a look at f5 to see the power of the rooks are they just standing pretty do they actually do something here e takes let's say e takes if instead here bishop d4 black could take could take here and you see the rooks are useful now even if it seems as though the f7 is is, is weak knight c5 indirectly starts to defend f7 with this queen and now black can play knight e4 leveraging both rooks here in this variation and here h5 becomes useful to defend h7 this position is nice for black this starts to be very very nice for black black's controlling the center and neutralizing white's attack and getting a lot of central control but the more beautiful variation let's have a look at f5 again just test this prophylaxis e takes f5 instead of bishop d4 
Bishop takes g2 weakens the diagonal of the bet. Bishop takes c3 weakens white on the light squares and punctures that d5 square. And now, although the rooks are still, you know, looking pretty and not apparently doing anything, here is where black can actually show the rooks are doing something by this puncturing of d5 with knight d5 now available, hitting e3. And if the bishop dares move, then there's rook e2. That shows the doubled rooks are dangerous. They're not just pretty rooks. So rook e1. And now queen c6 threatening a nasty discovered check on the king, showing that weakened diagonal. King g1. And now devastatingly, queen takes c3, putting pressure on e3 and e1. And this position shows in full glory, graphic, gory detail, the power of these two rooks. And that is why they have prophylaxis against f5. This is one key reason. If the bishop moves, we have rook takes e1 check, winning a piece here. So it seems as though this is absolutely gorgeous prophylaxis against f5 in this position. Rook d1 is played. And it looks as though it looks as though queen h4 is a useful move for white, even if h5 is a resource. So black actually now adds some defense to h7. Even though there's pressure along this diagonal, he Sparov plays f5 and it really tears open the position. It creates uh, pressure points now because if this is tolerated, then black has got been gifted defense along the second rank. If queen h4, there's also now not just knight f8, but there's also bishop h8 or bishop takes c3 with defense along the second rank. So that rook would be looking even dumber if this is allowed. So Karpov plays g takes f6. And Sporov, even with this battery here, he doesn't actually take with his bishop in this position. He doesn't. He, he actually now plays a positional pawn sacrifice. If he plays bishop takes f6, this might be good for white. Queen d2 on d6. And if the position closes, this rook is not embarrassed. If d5 is prompted, then e5 shuts out this bishop. Knight d4 brings that bad piece, kind of passive piece, into a great square. And this starts to look very, very nice. For example, here would be a bad move because of knight cb5, looking at that. So black is on the back foot here. White's doing nicely in this position. And the position is closed. It's, it's comfortable for white. Instead, Kasparov makes a gambit of it here. After this G takes, he plays knight takes f6. And look at the possibilities exploding here now. The b6 pawn is being offered. But on the other hand, with the bishop there, and the knight's now ready to jump very, very aggressively to g4. And look at this f pawn. This could be a target on the f file. A fantastically complicated position. And Saints comp off, take on b6 and see what happens. It turns out, technically, if Karpov was brave enough and calculating well enough, it looks as though bishop takes b6 may have been playable. Knight g4, trying to distract the queen away from the bishop. Bishop takes c7, knight takes f2, bishop takes d6. Knight takes d1, bishop takes e7. This is an example of a relation. Knight takes c3, a long forcing sequence, which would need careful calculation. But it seems technically here, white has an advantage. Does, does Karpov want to play like this? Not really, no. <laughs> he doesn't really want to play like this. It might be difficult to play this resulting position, but the engine suggests white has an advantage here. Okay, so no surprise, he, he wasn't that enamored by bishop takes b6 in this position. 
he played actually the more cautious looking rook g3 now the pawn is offered yet again with rook f7 and the beautiful point here is peace coordination black wants to start building teamwork in his position he wants all his pieces to target a vulnerability that has emerged from black playing f5 not white playing f5 the vulnerability being the f4 pawn if black can coordinate these pieces on f4 even with bishop h6 later then that would be very very nice he offers the b6 pawn here the position is exploding in complexity b6 is taken queen b8 the queen's not entirely passive here it's holding up d6 and maybe the b file will be useful later the bishop's a potential tactical vulnerability it's retreated back just in case it's loose later in this position instead of retreating the bishop back if rook f1 knight h5 hits the rook and f4 in this position you see black coordinating look at the coordinated pieces and black is now threatening bishop takes c3 and bishop takes e4 say bishop d4 say in this position king h1 first knight takes f4 it's nice for black the coordination is swinging a pawn say bishop d4 knight takes f4 takes this is okay for black also there's bishop h6 and there's coordination black has coordination on that f4 square all of a sudden four pieces are working together and blacks although he sacked that b pawn now even the queen gets activated there's huge pressure on white and f4 could drop in this variation with black being very comfortable so yeah it's uh it's dangerous now so yeah bishop e3 was played black plays knight h5 we have rook g4 knight f6 and Karpov can't have a draw remember if he draws Kasparov will be world champion Karpov needs to level the points in the match so instead of playing rook g3 he goes for it with rook h4 there's a slight snag here there's a forcing move Kasparov has in this position which can help uh, black can you see further opening up the position as well Kasparov is starting to lose pawns that's the clue so what does Kasparov play in this position if I give you five seconds you might want to pause the video black to play here with the loss of pawns we open up the position we explode the possibilities we improve the dynamic potential of our pieces the pawns are often getting in the way so what does black play in this position five more seconds starting from now if you want to pause the video g5 trying to expose the queen on that f file Karpov takes and then we have knight g4 a double attack on the queen and also looking at the bishop which will potentially if that bishop is snapped off then this diagonal is weakened queen d2 the rook is now threatening the queen's gone away from the attack so the rook is threatening the knight knight takes e3 weakening white on the dark squares and also now this c2 pawn is dropping so not only white has been weakened on dark squares c2 dropping has weakened now also b3 lots of weaknesses of the last move are sparking up in this position with black winning that c2 pawn look at black's beautiful double fianchetto bishops striking across the diagonals here queen b6 and we have now a move offering the exchange of queens bishop a8 but b3 will be loose after this this looks horrible in this position if bishop e5 rook c1 here knight d4 takes 
black is actually better after queen c7 trying to distract the queen away from d4 black would be better in this position so bishop e5 was also it's it's a very nice move bishop e5 in this position but Sparov played bishop a8 that's a nice practical move as well rook takes d6 which is a mistake here Karpov technically should have played queen takes d6 well no not queen takes d6 pardon me let's just check this again such a complicated position queen takes d6 no loses to queen takes b3 now in this position Karpov had to play taking the queens off and this apparently even if b3 lost here if bishop takes e6 here should be okay for white so yeah in this position after it's a very critical position after bishop a8 but best is queen takes b8 in this position rook takes d6 is technically it's, it's a mistake now because of rook b7 skewering the queen and knight white takes on a6 and cop and Sparf is taking that b3 a very very tense position rook takes e6 now Karpov in his last few moves although he's been taking pawns it looks greedy this diagonal is more sensitive the queen is ready to jump to c4 and here is Kasparov's turn to majorly blunder here he blunders technically he plays rook takes b2 in this position it's a big advantage for black apparently if rook b4 is played just stopping that use of c4 black is doing extremely well in this position in the game continuation by taking on b2 Karpov's last few moves taking pawns are justified now because the queen now gets on this dangerous diagonal threatening rook takes e8 checkmate King h8 is played and all of a sudden it seems as though Karpov can technically force a draw of course a draw is useless to him he'll lose his world title if, if there's a draw the engines are saying this is equal after rook takes queen takes knight d1 even though this looks remarkably complicated this this sequence it looks as though technically white uh, is equal because there are things like g6 getting dangerous scenarios against black's king this this scenario here is apparently ripping open black's king safety and looking as as though it's nearly equal and if uh, black here played king uh, g7 yeah the king looks too uh, unsafe it looks as though this should be equal this this is evaluated as dead equal but Karpov isn't has no interest in a draw so he doesn't play that forcing sequence even if he did calculate he plays e5 which looks very logical to give the queen access to h4 to be able to play rook takes h7 g6 and queen h4 it's a very very dangerous move in its own right but it's a mistake technically it is actually a mistake even though the threat seems extremely uh, great yeah the best move would have been apparently to to have taken as mentioned to take on e8 and then play the retreat it's ridiculous looking but this is technically the best move knight d1 here to hit the rook and the knight but yeah in the game this e5 now which was played let's Kasparov black back in the driving seat he plays a killer move well there's two good moves in this position but he plays the most incisive the check even though it leaves his rook hanging it's a check king h1 And now another check which activates and justifies the whole rook b2 is now justified 
the rook being on the second rank because there's a killer discovered check now after king takes knight d4 discovered check winning the rook safely Karpov is forced to resign What a fantastic game. If king h1, knight takes e6. Where's where's white's attack? This is useless now, rook takes. This is just useless. Here, it's not doing anything. Check, king f8, and then the end of, end of attack. White's getting mated. So yeah, after the discovered uh, check, white resigned. A phenomenally complex game. Karpov playing e4, which he rarely does. He had to play f5, it seems, earlier. And eventually, Kasparov played amazing prophylaxis against f5. The rooks weren't just looking pretty. They had concrete implications, including taking on, on c3 to weaken squares, to actually weaken the diagonal and key squares, and might be losing material after. So f5 was actually technically prevented with the amazing prophylaxis moves and then it seems Karpov was collecting pawns with no significance but they did and Karpov kind of justified it with a blunder with rook takes b2 there was a point where queen c1 and knight d1 was important but instead Karpov justified that rook on the second rank uh, he didn't. He had to play a very, very forcing sequence, but it was useless to him to draw. That's the thing. So he kind of blown his chance already. He didn't want to draw after that. He has to he had to win this game, and then the rook was justified eventually on the second rank. It was justified with the amazing discovered attack, winning the rook on e6 with no attack for white, black just material up, and with this game, Kasparov became world chess champion this was the game which let Kasparov finally defeat Anatoly Karpov in in their second match after the aborted match so Kasparov became world chess champion an amazing triumph an amazingly dramatic game I hope you got something from it comments or questions on YouTube thanks very much